Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Abby Lester, and I am the director of the JDC Global Archives. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's book talk. This program is part of our new webinar series, The Latin American and Caribbean Jewish Experience in the 20th Century. First, a few words about the archives. The JDC Archives, with locations in both New York and Jerusalem, houses the records of the organization since its creation over 100 years ago. The archives is an unparalleled repository of modern Jewish history. Its vast holdings document JDC's global humanitarian mission, activities, and partnerships from World War I to the present, providing an exceptional perspective on the organization's work in over 90 countries. One of the most important repositories in the world for the study of modern Jewish history, visiting scholars from around the world utilize our unique offerings for their research, as do publishers, journalists, family researchers, curators, filmmakers, and others. To support scholarly research in our collections, we also offer fellowships funded by generous donors. Our program today explores the book, currently only available in Spanish, Escape to the Andes, the story of Mauricio Hochschild, the Schindler of Bolivia, through the reflections of its co-authors, Raul Peñaranda and Robert Brockman, who will each give a presentation. There will be time for a Q&A after the presentations. Please note, your microphones are turned off and we will take questions via the Q&A function in Zoom. You can send us questions at any time during the presentations. Our first speaker today is Raul Peñaranda who is a Bolivian journalist and writer. He is currently the editor of the news portal, Brujula Digital, Digital Compass, that he founded in 2018. Peñaranda has been the editor and founder of three outlets in Bolivia, the weeklies La Epoca and Nueva Economia, and the daily Pagina Siete. Raul Peñaranda is the author or co-author of 12 books on journalism and politics. He has won numerous awards, including the Maria Moores Cabot, conferred by Columbia University, the Nyman Fellowship at Harvard University, the Reagan Fassel Fellowship at the National Endowment for Democracy, and the gold medal given by the UN Correspondents Association. Raul Peñaranda will now give his presentation. Thank you, dear Abby, for this very warm introduction and the opportunity that JDC is giving us to speak about our book. Robert and I are very thankful of that. So, gracias, thank you. Also, thanks to Isabel and Abra for all the time invested in preparing this webinar. And of course, to all the assistants. Thanks for uh, the interest. So, you see there the picture of uh, Robert and me uh, presenting the book in, uh, in Santiago. Well, it was one of the, the, the many presentations that, that we give, uh, but this was in Santiago, so it was exciting for Robert and me going there and, and giving the, the presentation there, uh, and it was a successful one. Please, next. So you're seeing here the cover of our book. It's been distributed in Spanish in several Latin American countries this year by Aguilar a branch of Penguin Random House. Our US agent is working hard to have an English version. We hope that this will uh, happen soon. The book is written in narrative journalism style, uh, as we say in Spanish, una crónica, a chronicle. The book tells the story of Mauricio Bord Moritz Hoschild, a non-religious German Jewish businessman who made his fortune in Bolivia in the 20s. Please, next. After the so-called National Revolution of 1952, the Bolivian historiography portrayed Hoschild and two other important mining businessmen as ruthless and abusive. The other two were Patiño and Aramayo. I will speak about them in a while. They were called the Tin Barons, and Hoschild was depicted as the worst of the three but he was also the savior of 12,000 Jews, nothing less at the eve of the Holocaust. This is the key of our book and now and how Hoschild accomplished that. We describe all his efforts 
that he make to obtain his goal. Hoshil is known now as the Schindler of Bolivia, as Abby said. But if the Bolivian historiography represented him only as a villain, we didn't want to represent him only as a hero. Every person has flaws and virtues, as you know, and Horschild is no exception. Next, please. Horschild had a cinematographic life. For example, while in Paris after the Nazi in invasion, a daring French pilot rescued him from an airstrip. If detained, he could have ended up in a concentration camp and this story would have never happened. Also, he was detained in a public jail in Bolivia in the 40s, accused of subversive activities, participating in a coup. To add more drama, in other point of his life, he was threatened with execution by Bolivian dictator Bush himself, Herman Bush. I will speak more about Bush in a while. He was instrumental in this story. He was Hoschel's ally in the effort to bring refugees to Bolivia. They were friends, but in some point, Bush broke with him and menaced with executing him. In his presentation, Robert will give more context of all of this that I'm speaking now. Hoschel was also kidnapped in another government in 1944 and subjected to false shootings by fire, firing squads. A US FBI agent was appointed to find him. He left Bolivia in 1944 when he was, was finally released, never to return. Next, please. Let me tell you a little bit about the documents we used uh, in our book. In 1952, the tin barons companies were nationalized in Bolivia. Thousands of documents of the companies were kept by the government. They consisted especially in accountant records like export, imports, tax payments, and so on. The documents were left in sheds. Many were lost, while others were exposed to the elements. In the late 90s, began a process aimed at the recovery. The person responsible for this is in the picture on the left, Edgar Ramirez, a mining union leader. This guy led a dual life. Apart from being a fierce workers leader, he had a passion for archives and papers and he secured funds to protect the documents. In 2016, a decade and a half later, a significant announcement was made. Among the documents, a big bunch of them proved that Hoschel had saved thousands of lives. The documents are now protected by UNESCO. When I knew about this, I thought that this would make a perfect material for a book. But my colleague Robert had found clues to this story even before that, and he was also playing with the idea of writing a book. He even wrote about this in another book that he presented a couple of years earlier. Because we're friends and colleagues, we found out about our mutual plans and decided to write the book together. Another source of documents is the JDC, the JDC archives. Hoschel maintained a close relationship with the JDC representatives during years and exchanged tens of telegrams, cables, and letters about his plans. So that was a very important source of uh, information for us, the JDC archives. We also made many interviews and revised all the bibliography referred to our topic. There's no text chapter of a book a uh, magazine article or anything about Hoschild uh, that we, that Robert and, and I haven't read. Next, please. Hoschild, a mining engineer, arrived in Chile in early 20th century with his brother Sally, where they created a mining company. Their uncle was Zachary Hoschild, one of the most important mining businessmen in the world at that time. After creating their mining company, Mauricio had to go back to Germany to participate in World War I as an engineer. Then he came back and decided to part ways with his brother, who stayed in Chile and became also an important mining businessman. Mauricio went to Bolivia. He arrived in the country in 1921 at the age of 40. In less 
than a decade, he became the second richest man in Bolivia, second only to the mythical Simon Patiño, the king of Tim. Patiño is considered one of the richest men on, on earth during the first half of the century, last century. His cousin Bertolt Horschild led a mining company in the US at the same time. Bertolt's grandson, Adam Horschild, the famed US writer, kindly provided us with some information about Mauricio. The next, please. Horschild was initially a wholesaler of minerals, especially tin, a rescuer of minerals, as the word goes in Spanish, un rescatista, un rescatador. But after some years, he became a true mining entrepreneur, buying and managing mine companies. The three tin barons that I already mentioned, Aramayo, Patino, and Hoshit himself, controlled the world production of tin and other minerals. Such power gave them critical leverage, allowing them to patronize a political system where for a number of years, they had the last word. In the picture, you see the cabinet of one of our presidents, uh, General Toro in the 40s, to show you a little bit of how uh, the political uh, looked. Uh, the next, please. After 1933, when Hitler got in power, many Jewish entities began to contact Hoshil to see if Bolivia could be a refuge for those persecuted by the Nazi regime. One of those entities was the JDC. Hoshil's answer was always no, although he hired about 200 Jewish workers and engineers in his mines in Bolivia, and dozens more in the offices of his company in Argentina, Chile, and Peru. His manager once responded that Bolivia was the worst country in the world for possible migrations. Bolivia had just emerged from the war against Paraguay. We are a poor country now in Bolivia. We were even poor in, uh, in the 30s. You can imagine that after that war that lasted two years was very bloody. Uh, the war uh, ended in 35. So it was, in, as, as the manager of Hoshil said, the worst country in the, in the world to have refugees. Next, please. Even though the horrors in Europe against the Jewish community were unbearable, by 38 and 39, all the countries in the region closed their doors to migrants, Peru, Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, and Brazil. There were not many differences in the rest of the world. The US rejected fulfilling its quotas of German migrants, much less increasing them. Most world countries were not issuing visas to receive Jewish migrants. Great Britain also reduced the visas, only giving them to children. So Hoshil had an epiphany. The worst country in the world was the only one that could save lives. It's a feat. One of the poorest countries on earth did what the richest powers didn't. There you see a picture of uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish people in, uh, in Vienna queuing in front of a consulate trying to get a visa. That was the desperate situation of, uh, of these people. Next, please. So Hoshil rolled up his sleeves and began the difficult plan to receive European refugees. In 1938, Hoshil managed to convince the revolutionary Bush to issue a decree that opened the doors of the country without restriction. Hermann Bush, a military and the son of a German immigrant was the president, a dictator. Hermann was abandoned by his father when he was a newborn. Pay attention to his name, Hermann, German. He even spelled the same, the same in Spanish, Hermano. So his father was telling something to him with this name, you're German. Being German himself, Hoshil could connect with Bush. He also could have been his father. Bush was very young. He was in his 30s and Horschel was in his late 50s. So Horschel was probably a paternal figure for Bush. Even though Bush had nationalist ideas, Horschel helped as an informal counselor of the presidency and that helped 
in his plan. Next, please. Unlike any other country, after the 1933 decree, Bolivia didn't require refugees to have funds or prearranged job in Bolivia or any kind of affidavit, very different from other countries. And after receiving their visas, the refugees had to first travel by boat from Europe, go through the Panama Canal, go south in the Pacific coast until the port of Arica in the north of Chile. And as you know, Bolivia is a landlocked country. The exiles then took from Chile a 36 hour train journey to La Paz in the highlands of Bolivia, located at 14,000 feet of altitude. La Paz with 250,000 inhabitants at a time could not even offer enough rooms for rent to the newcomers. Next, please. Hoshil began to provide resources for refugees in the form of money, and also basic items like blankets, beds, tables, chairs, ovens. Those people came with nothing, not a penny. The Jewish families immediately started working. Some opened cafes and restaurants, others created small factories. For example, they manufactured hats or underwear or wooden furniture. Bolivia didn't produce at the time almost nothing and that favored the ingenious migrants work. Hoshil offered loans to anyone, to any exile that wanted to start a shop or a small factory. Those loans were not returned. The migra migrants left an important mark in Bolivia. For example, the first symphonic orchestra in Bolivia was created by Jewish musicians that later trained their local colleagues. There were also many university prof professors, many chemists, physicists, physicians, uh, engineers were hired as university professors here in La Paz and other cities in Oruro, near La Paz, in the highlands. Also, um, and, and it's a mining region. Uh, the, the, the mining engineering program at the university was created, for example, for uh, by a, uh, a Jewish engineer. Not everyone could adapt though. Many suffered the rigors of exile and the horrors that were happening in Europe took a heavy toll on them. Many committed suicide. Our friend and writer Leo Spitzer, born in La Paz to an Austrian family, is the author of a beautiful book, Hotel Bolivia. In that book, he describes the difficulties of adaptation of certain members of his family. Next, please. Oshild lived estranged from his only son, Gerardo, born in 1920. In the picture, you see him with his German wife. You can notice that he had the same looks of his father. Oshild could save thousands of lives, be very charming, and have the ability to tell 2,000 jokes, as he liked to say, but he could not connect with his only son. In the end, he disinherited him. This triggered bitter lawsuits in various courts around the world between father and son. He suffered due to the rejection of his father. Gerardo was the son of Kete Rosenbaum, who died when he was four years old. He was then left in charge of governesses and tutors, always trying to gain acceptance from his father. Next, please. After becoming a widower, Horschild started in 1921 a relationship with Germaine Kayers, a Belgian woman that was going to prove itself to be turbulent. They married and get divorced twice, but stay in contact for all of their lives. Mauricio had met Germaine because she was the wife of his cousin, Philip Horschild, whom he hired to work in Bolivia. Germaine and Mauricio had an affair and decided to tell Philip about it and that they wanted to marry. Philip had to go back to, to Chile. He sold his shares of the company. He accepted the situation and he, and he went to work with Sally, Mauricio's brother. When she was in her late 60s in a fit of jealousy, even though she was separated from Mauricio, Germaine attempted suicide by throwing herself from a high floor of her house 
resulting seriously injured. Mauricio moved to Switzerland, Switzerland to take care of her during the last months of her life. She died in 1962. The relationship on and off lasted 33 years. This was a couple that could not live apart, but could not be happy when they were together. Our research found that Mauricio was not a ladies' man. He went to bed early and didn't drink in excess. Next, please. This is my last uh, slide, and thank you for your time and your patience. Mauricio spent the last years of his life traveling from city to city, often alone. He used to stay at the Ritz Carlton while in New York City. He died in 1965 at the age of 84 in a hotel in Paris, city where his remains rest. And here you see the picture of the Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris, reserved for important personalities. And of course, uh, Horsil one uh, was one of them. So thank you. This is the my presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Raul. I'm going to now introduce our second speaker today, Robert Brockman. We'll get back to you, Raul, in a little bit. Robert Brockman is currently a university professor, journalist, writer, and strategic communications consultant. He studied communication sciences at the Universidad Católica San Pablo in La Paz, Bolivia, and journalism and photography at Arizona State University. He specialized in international journalism at the Academie für Publicité and the Deutsche Presse Agentur in Hamburg. He was an international correspondent and associate editor of La Razón newspaper in La Paz. He is a fellow of the Hemispheric Center for Defense Studies in Washington. He has written, edited, and translated several books and anthologies. Robert Brockman will now start his presentation. Thank you very much, Abby. Uh, I'm very honored to be here. I thank you, my, my friend and partner, Raul, for his presentation. I, I, I see that some very good friends and, and people who our book owes to them are present, and I hope they are seeing this presentation. Uh, Robert Cowders in, in New York, uh, Leo Collier in South Africa, who provided us with the critical information about, about Hochschild and, and enormous amounts of, uh, of information. So thank you very much. Um, uh, Raul has already given a, a, an excellent uh, introduction on, on, the, on the book and, and has even gone uh, further than a mere introduction. The second half, uh, I have to tell you something. One of the most remote origins of this book uh, is in the gift that a great Bolivian historian, Mariano Baptista, gave me many years ago. It was a large manila envelope with a thick bundle of photocopies of Hochschild documents from precisely the Joint Distribution Committee. It included a guide to documents available online about the mining entrepreneur. I used this information to publish a biography of Bolivian President Herman Bush in 2017, which is this one, let me show you. This is the book, um, which includes a, a couple of key chapters, uh, key chapters about the partnership of these two men, Hermann Busch and Mauricio Hochschild, in rescuing Jew Jewish refu uh, refugees on the eve of the Shoah in the most unlikely of countries, which is Bolivia. Raul has already explained key aspects and now it is my turn to tell you about other fascinating sides of this character, Mauricio Hochschild. Next, please. Mauricio Hochschild was a true global entrepreneur already in the first third of the 20th century, making extensive use of all means of transportation available at, at the time, including Zeppelins. He lived for business. He was a workaholic and spent several months a year in New York, in London, in Paris, in Frankfurt and Vienna, as well as in Santiago, Buenos Aires and Lima, visiting clients, foundries, suppliers and his own office branches, of course. It can be said that he lived more in trains, ships and hotels than in his own home. In fact, since he was widowed for the first time, he only had two houses, two houses throughout his life, a rented mansion in La Paz, 
that he shared with his second wife, Germaine, when she accompanied him. That is what it, it is. It is really big for two persons only. And later, another house he own in Arosa in Switzerland. One has to admire the fact that his trips were planned from La Paz, a city then as now, very remotely located and poorly connected to global transportation routes. Next, please. When the Nazis came to, to power in January 1933, one of their first anti-Semitic measures was to deprive all German Jews outside Germany's borders of their citizenships and passports. For the average person, statelessness can be a tragedy. But Mauricio Hochschild fixed this issue in a few weeks. He could have gotten a Chilean passport since the legal headquarters in his company was in Valparaiso, or a Bolivian passport since the bulk of his business was in Bolivia, plus he lived there. Next, please. But he opted for an Argentine passport. Why? Raul and I have searched high and low looking for clues in so many documents and archives and, and interviewing relatives, and there is no trace of a reason or the mechanism to obtain a nationality of a country you do not live in but we have an educated guess because the Argentine passport was powerful. Argentina was then one of the most prosperous countries on earth and Hochschild had a branch office in Argentina. An Argentinian passport could overcome several difficulties in his long and complex, tra complex transatlantic, transcontinental travels through multiple countries and involving trains, ships, and even zeppelins. Moreover, Hochschild spent a good deal of time in the great cosmopolitan capital, Buenos Aires, where he could establish a very, where he, where he would establish a very important partnership and bridgehead for the channeling of aid to the first German Jews fleeing the Third Reich. The Argentinian organization of his partner, Adolf Hirsch, would establish the model for what would later become his own Bolivian rescue organization. Next, please. Undaunted by the political circumstances, he sailed for Germany in 1933. Once in the old country, Hochschild had to negotiate with the Berzelius foundry, which had been pivotal in establishing his business model of buying low grade minerals. But he was faced with a, with a German interlocutor with little inclination for haggling and horseplay. Hochschild probably insisted or make a joke that did not sit well with the German. Annoyed, he brought up Mauricio's Jewishness and sent for the Nazi SA troop in the vicinity. The SA men dragged Hochschild to the street and they roughed him badly. If they did not lock him up in a dungeon or concentration camp, it was precisely because Mauricio was no longer a German, but an Argentinian citizenship citizen. He the deprivation of his German citizenship had proven a mixed blessing. The incident nevertheless made him aware of the seriousness of the situation of the Jews in Germany and led to his determination to remove his extended family and as many Jews as he could from the country. In time, he would even plan to evacuate Christian children from Belgium, but first, as he moved his family members out of Germany, he also moved his head office from Germany to Belgium. Next, please. As early as mid-1933, Jewish organizations of all kinds and backgrounds began sending inquiries to Hochschild's South American offices, but mainly to La Paz. Is Bolivia a viable safe haven was the main question repeated over and over. Hochschild systematically replied that Bolivia was not a suitable destination for refugees, a country rich in resources, but chronically poor, without roads, without jobs, at war with Paraguay. It had not the, slightly, the slightest possibility of assimilating even a small number of refugees. Moreover, Enrique Ellinger, his trusted right-hand man replied, it is the worst possible place to arrive without a job. Instead, Hochschild 
devoted himself to coordinating with a network of Jewish entities in the great Western countries, channeling resources. Hisem, H-I-C-E-M, for example, Raul and I were unable to find the meaning of this acronym, but it is an omnipresent entity that annoyed Hochschild, plus others that changed their names many times, particularly in Britain. But without a doubt, Mauricio became a main coordinator with the Joint Distribution Committee, the entity which graciously hosts us today, and which was Hochschild's main stakeholder in the eve of the Holocaust and beyond. A word about the map you are seeing, for those of you who are not familiar with the map of, of, of Bolivia. The Chaco, the region in dispute with Paraguay, is that salient, that, that salient at the south east of the country. Bolivia lost 85% of the Chaco, and now in its place, the Bolivian map has something very much like a semicircular bite in its place. Next, please. Between 1933 and 1938, Hochschild, without neglecting his mining business, became a driving force and an essential, essential articulator of rescue efforts in the highest circles in London, Paris, New York, and Washington. He was a privileged interlocutor of the High Commissioner for Refugees of the League of Nations. He was the fourth member, let's call him that, of three very prominent Jewish members of the House of Lords who achieved briefly the opening of Great Britain. A great achievement was the Kindertransport, which took in a couple of thousand German children to the British Isles, whose parents had been interned in concentration camps for the crime of being Jewish. Hochschild contributed with the argument that the Jewish international community, particularly Jewish millionaires, would support their own kind, and national states would not have to incur any expenses. A surprising finding for me personally was that London had, 100 years ago, a Jewish mayor of Iraqi origin. British cosmopolitanism is not a thing of today. Next, please. Hochschild also intensively lobbied in Washington. First among important Jewish businessmen, peers as proxies, who, it must be said, viewed with a, a resignation bordering on indifference the fate of their German and Central European counterparts. He reached a third level in the State Department where a Jewish official appointed by President Roosevelt himself, although empathetic to the situation, could do little against what in our book is revealed as an anti-Semitic and xenophobic cobweb among the operators of the State Department. Hochschild was able to briefly contend against this small but powerful network of officials who refused to open America's doors to European Jewish refugees who were being treated cruelly and would soon be massively murdered. It is estimated that their opposition caused the death of a minimum bear of at least 1,000 100,000 uh, human beings who could have been saved from the jaws of Nazism. Next, please. From late 1938 to mid-1939, approximately 10,000 Jewish refugees arrived in Bolivia, according to Hochschild's own and quite thorough account. Some other 2,000 dripped along the war, coming from various countries, whether from Europe or other American republics. They made a total of approximately 12,000 by 1941. In a country that was almost completely unable to absorb their impact, all of them obtained refuge and means of subsistence with the bulk of the resources channeled through or advanced by the Hochschild organization. Bolivia, for its part, did not turn away a single asylum seeker, despite the blatant illegality of a multitude of visas, of visas and passports. As often happens in humanitarian crises like this one, the tragedy gave birth to a corrupt network of Bolivian diplomatic officials who amassed real fortunes selling visas and passports to desperate human beings. It happened not only in Bolivia, but the book records similar cases in Peru and Cuba. The book shows how corruption took as many lives as it probably saved. Next, please. 
In June 1939, the friendship between Bush and Hochschild was broken. The president, without prior notice, took a revolutionary measure. He issued a decree temporarily expropriating the total of the profits in hard cur currency of the mining exporters. The central bank would manage from then on the foreign currency and would return it in foreign currency only for expenses that the companies could justify. A top of 5% was also established for the payment of dividends to shareholders. Bolivians were glued to, to the radio when Bush announced the decree, which produced enormous public support, as well as a huge shakeup in Bolivian politics. It was the most revolutionary measure to date taken in the country. But if all this strongly affected the three tin barons, it hurt Hochschild the most. The decree established that the state became the sole buyer of minerals. Thus, Hochschild's business model was affected at its core. Confident in his friendship with Bush, Hochschild defied his supreme decree, and thus the president sentenced him to death by firing squad. Bush was not joking. He, he, he already had, had shot two, two other people. The issue was a major one. The miner who saved only was, was only saved by the dramatic intercession of Bush's cabinet and international pressure. A few weeks later, Bush, who suffered from bipolar syndrome, committed suicide. There are even some who claim that he was murdered, against all evidence, and point to, to, to Hochschild as one of the most consistent suspects. This would have terrible consequences for the miner within a few years. A brief moment, a, a brief comment, excuse me, a brief comment about the photograph. This is the memorial for Bush in the city of Santa Cruz. In his right hand, he carries the famous decree of June 7, 1939, the one I have just spoken about. His gesture and demeanor have everything to do with the imposition on the three tin barons, and in particular with Hochschild's defiance and his sentence to death by firing squad. Next, please. Once the relative well-being of his rescued refugees had been achieved, Hochschild devoted himself to another cause dear to his heart. He undertook to contribute to the defeat of the Third Reich. To this end, he became the main operator for the supply of tin for the Allied war effort in the Western Hemisphere. After Bush's premature death, eventually Bolivia, like most of the American republics, declared war on Germany in 1943. The most important tin mines in the world, in Malaya, were held by the Japanese. So Bolivia, through its government and Hochschild, as well as the other tin barons, but mainly he, was the main supplier to the allies. Tin is used to make tin cans, the lining of oil barrels, the aluminum from which airplanes are made, electronic components, and bullet casings. That's how important it is. But an important faction of the Bolivian army rejected the declaration of war on Germany, the sale of tin at liquidation prices to the USA, and resented Hochschild in particular as a foreigner, as a capitalist, as an exploiter, and especially as a Jew. A coup d'etat took place in late 1943, and another president, a friend of the Nazis, assumed power. Next, please. In April 1944, Hochschild was imprisoned and held in jail for a couple of months, accused of financing a conspiracy. Foreign pressure, especially American, succeeded in getting him released, but the more radical faction of the government was not happy. Freshly released from jail, they kidnapped Hochschild in order to assassinate him and send the message, we are not with the Allies and we repudiate this Jewish exploiter. Hochschild was nearly executed at least three times during the fortnight of his kidnapping, but his kidnappers were almost comically shoddy. With Hochschild missing, the tin supply was at risk. President Roosevelt himself commissioned J. Edgar Hoover's FBI to find the businessman. A rescue operation was mounted. Once freed, the operation to evacuate Hochschild from Bolivia, involving the whole diplomatic corps, was spectacular. 
Next, please. After leaving Bolivia following his liberation, he never set foot in the country again. After the war, another 8,000 Jews arrived in Bolivia, survivors of camps, summoned by their friends and relatives and Hochschild's protection and livelihood network. In 1952, the Bolivian National Revolution, composed of a government similar to the one that had kidnapped him, nationalized his companies. With that, Hochschild lost 80% of his assets again. When I say again, it is because in, he, he had lost, uh, he had suffered a similar loss in the, during the Great Depression in 1929, 1930. But capable as he was of turning stones into money, literally, he soon found very rich copper deposits in Chile, thus reestablishing himself as the richest miner in South America and one of the most important in the world. Old and estranged from his family, he died alone in his hotel room in Paris in 1965. His fortune evaporated in an opaque operation of his relatively new managers. Today, there are Hochschilds in South America, South Africa, the United States, and England, all direct descendants or descendants of my Mauricio's siblings or cousins, all talented to the point of extraordinary. A word about that photograph. It was contained in the innumerable digital documentation we obtained from different sources. That photograph illustrates the July 1947 issue of Fortune magazine. What is remarkable for, uh, for photography lovers is that it was taken by the great uh, portrait photographer Arnold Newman when he was very young. One of his earliest portraits, perhaps, it is on deposit in, this, in his estate at a Californian university, and in my opinion, it is a perfect portrait of this extraordinary man. I just want to underscore the importance of making the world known this character in a moment where it is most needed, in a moment where anti-Semitism and racism of every kind are on the rise. Just when we thought stories like this were to be a lesson from the past, they become more actual and necessary as ever. Next, please. Thank you very, very much for your patience, your interest, and uh, Raul and I are thrilled to, to have you, and we will answer as many questions as you have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Thank you both. Um, we'll be getting Raul back on here. Great. Um, what a fascinating life. Uh, thank you both for, for sharing um, your presentations. And we already have many questions, and we'll open it up to these questions. Just a reminder to everybody that your microphones are turned off um, and we're taking the questions via the Q&A function. There are a lot, so we may not be able to get to all of them, um, but we will be sharing the questions um, with both Robert and Raul in, um, to, to reach out if, if we haven't gotten to the question. So let's start out um, with where reminding people where you can get this book. Um, because we do have a couple of questions about that. Yes, sure. Well, uh, the book is is being is being sold in, in in Latin America in several cities. If you're in Latin America, in Buenos Aires, in many cities in Chile, also in Mexico now, and in Bolivia, of course. But if you're not in Latin America, you can buy the book in Amazon, uh, in in Spanish, and uh, it will get uh, to your address. Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit, there's a question about Hochschild's Judaism, and was he a practicing Jew when he lived in Germany or after he arrived in Bolivia, and any ideas on what his Judaism meant, meant to him? Yeah, well, he, he comes from a, from a Jewish family, which was established in the town of Biblis near Frankfurt in the current state of Hessen in Germany. Uh, his generation was was secular. They were not. They were not. Neither his his siblings nor his father or mother. But he had a great grandfather who was who was a rabbi. Who was in charge of the synagogue uh, in the golden time of, of Judaism in 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 um, in, in Biblis. Uh, he didn't care much for Judaism until the Nazis made him. So that's the short answer. I hope I I hope I answered. Okay. And it didn't change at all when he was in Bolivia, other than, other than being interested in rescuing the Jews. 
there no. wasn't that. Okay. He he didn't become a relig religious man at any point. No. Okay. Um, moving to a different topic, can you, is there any more insight on how Hulk Shield convinced Bush, President Bush, to issue entry visas to German Jews and what their, maybe a little more on what their relationship was like? Uh, sure. I, th 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 there is uh, some evidence that, uh, that Hulk Shield told uh, Bush that Bolivia needed more white people, more Europeans. Okay, so that that was uh, one of the reasons that uh, could convince uh, Bush. Or the other reason was that we needed people working uh, in the fields, agriculture, right? Uh, so so Hoshil was hopeful, and but I think that he knew that probably uh, that was not the case. All the people coming to Bolivia were from cities, Vienna, Berlin, whatever, Warsaw. Uh, they were not agriculture. Uh, they, they didn't know about our agriculture, but the, anyway, there was a, there was a, uh, a a plan, a program for these people to go to a place here uh, near La Paz, uh, where uh, a, a plan uh, to settle this uh, this ref refugees uh, uh, was made, but it didn't work precisely because they were city city people and also the place where they. They sent them was tropical, too hot, too warm, um, so the too humid. Uh, but but those were the, the ideas that Hoshield uh, presented to Bush. First, these people are from Europe; they're going to help the country to 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 progress. Great, thank you. Um, there were actually we just had an explosion in questions, so I'm just doing a quick. A quick glance. Um, what what brought you to write about him? How did you stumble upon this topic? Where did the where did that interest come from? Well, I, I will start. When I was a, an, an active journalist, I made um, a photo reportage in my hometown of, of Cochabamba, which was called Multicultural Death. I was going to take pictures of several cemeteries, in, starting with the German cemetery where my family lies. There is the Lebanese cemetery, which has its own cultural and architectural traits. There was the, the, the Yugoslavian, the, 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 the Croatian uh, cemetery and so on. And I knew there was a Jewish cemetery, though I had never found it. So after looking for it, I found it and I was not prepared to what I said, I, I saw. First of all, it was three times as big as the German, being that the German community was far older in the country. And it was so beautiful because it, it had its own architectural, architectural and cultural traits. So, and, and when you saw naturally the, the places of birth and the places of, of death of the people, one was born in Hamburg, in, in Vienna, in, Ber in Brno, and whatever, and they th died in Cochabamba. And I said, where is all these people? So the question stayed in my mind. Years after, as I, I said, uh, I was given this, uh, this uh, bunch of documents from the JDC, which told me the story of how Bush and, and, and Hoshil came into, into partnership to rescue Jews. And I put it in my book. So that was the start for me, their own. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I, I mentioned a little bit uh, about this in my presentation. When when in 2016 the the documents uh, were released from the from the archive, the mine and archive, I thought that it was this this was a fantastic story. Uh, also, uh, because of Hotel Bolivia, the book uh, of Leo Spitzer that I that I talk about, uh, where he's where where Leo says that there that. Uh, uh, Bolivia opened uh, open its doors. We didn't know exactly, and the book gave us some uh, idea, but we didn't know the importance of Hoshield. We knew that a community had come to, to, to Bolivia, but we didn't know the number. <laughs> Interesting, it's not, it's only 90 years ago or 80 years ago, but we didn't know the numbers. And also that the figure of Hoshield has been so important. So I thought that it was a, uh, a, a, a material for, for a book. 
and the effort that Hochschild made uh, contacted people in Britain, in the US, in Argentina, as, as Robert said in, in his presentation. So a, so a man that comes to Bolivia uh, gets rich very, uh, uh, very fast in less than a decade, loses his fortune uh, in, the, in the crash of 29, recovers again, loses the, the money again in 52 and gets rich again. I mean, everything uh, was good for, for a book. Very true, very true. Um, there are some questions about how many of the refugees that ended up in Bolivia quickly moved um, to, to other countries in the region or outside of, of the region entirely. Do you, do you have any information on that? Yeah, Robert. Yes. Uh, in the heyday of, uh, of, of the Jewish community in Bolivia, let's say that late 60s, there were like, 15,000 members. Uh, and then they became, began to rapidly decline because Bolivia had, has never been a country that favored immigration. And this is not the case only for the Jewish community, but for the, for the whole international community. Uh, so, um, and the, the reason is not only because of economic reasons that the country cannot assimilate such a quantity of people, but the fact in the case of the Jewish community that, that you cannot be Jewish. You cannot exercise your Judaism because the dwindling numbers um, prevent from 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 having uh, um, rabbis or so on, and and so it's a it's a uh, a circle that 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 that, go, that goes downstairs. Right now, are there are like four hundred individuals in Bolivia, uh, mostly concentrated in the eastern city of of Santa Cruz, but some in Cochabamba, some in La Paz. That those are the numbers currently. Okay. And can you talk a little bit more about that, the, the current Jewish community in Bolivia? Raul? Yes. Um, there are, uh, well, the, the numbers are small, as, as Robert said. And uh, in, in general, there are good professionals. There are some of them very well known uh, by the rest of the of, this, of society, uh, respected. Um, we can say I would say that there is no anti-Semitism uh, in Bolivia or obvious anti-Semitism. Sure, sure there is, but uh, but uh, that didn't prevent any of, of the members of the Jewish community to have a career, be respected, uh, etc. Also interesting that uh, maybe we didn't mention that in the 30s and 40s, uh, the Jewish community here in Bolivia could do all the activities that any other Bolivian uh, could, could do, uh, like, for example, go to the bank or have a loan or go to school, send children to school. Such a difference from, from Germany and Europe of those years. They came here to a place totally different and they had their, their rights. Uh, but yes, as Robert said, now the, the, the numbers are very, very small. Uh, probably 15,000 in the 60s and then declining until now. May I complement the, the, the answer, please? Uh, Dale. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, we made a short list with uh, Dr. Ricardo Udler, who's the president of the Jewish com community of, of politicians who, were, who held public offices. There's, there's a short list of them. Uh, but the fact is that in the in the 30s and, and 40s there was uh, even a, a, a theater company who, which made plays in German. There was a radio program in German. There was a, 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 a periodical in German. No, uh, so so it was suddenly Bolivia in the late 1930s and early 40s. Uh, it was a very uh, cosmopolitan society, which is must have been most interesting. I, I would give an arm to to live there and see how it was. Do you, there's an interesting question. Um, did Holshield have any role models who inspired his humanitarian work that you came across? Any any collaborators in South America um, that he may have worked with? or gotten ideas from? Robert? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he, in 1933, he stumbled with uh, 
he, he met he met in Buenos Aires Adolf Hirsch, who who uh, had uh, founded the first Hilfsverein für Deutsch sprechende Juden, um, and uh, he they they began collaborating immediately. So Hochschild began channeling resources from various places to towards Buenos Aires. So the 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 the, the Hirsch model was perhaps his uh, his own his own model uh, later on, but most importantly he surrounded himself with very good men, and especially since the Nazis were expelling Jewish professionals of any kind, he really had a very wide wide menu of people to, to, to choose from for, for his companies. And he chose very good managers, very good managers. And they were compromised, but they were, they were committed to the, to, the, to the issue of rescuing their own people, of course. And uh, there was a saying that he said, uh, that he said mockingly, half serious, half, uh, half jokingly, our success, we owe it to the Führer. You mentioned earlier that there was uh, possibly some of the interest from, from Hermann Busch to bring uh, refugees yeah. to, to Bolivia. And there's a similarity in, with um, Trujillo in the Dominican Republic, um, similar refuge idea for possibly similar reasons. Was there any connection um, between, that you've seen between Trujillo and Bush? I don't think I don't think that there was any connection. And I think that Trujillo was a, a, a very tough, a, a very tough dictator. And, and he was known because he was a, a, that tough. And probably he opened the doors also as a PR kind of uh, uh, idea, right? First of all, and second, I think that very few uh, Jewish migrants went to uh, Dominican Republic. Uh, really, I mean, in 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 in, in fact, uh, we have this idea that uh, Dominican Republic was the the, the place where they, they they went, but it's not true. And Bolivia, that had so such a big numbers, uh, kept was kept under the radar. Uh, also, um, Bush uh, was a very recent dictator i mean it, it was starting his 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 government different than uh, than than trujillo but i think that the idea was to 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 have be, to have uh, people better prepared as i said and also in the agri in the agriculture we didn't produce as i said food or anything we needed that and uh, but th those migrants <laughs> were were professionals or, or commerce, whatever, they, they didn't know about that. A, a word about Bush, if I, if I may, please. Uh, he, had, he had some, some, some Nazi sympathies because of his father, uh, but he, did, he, he didn't share with the Nazis the, the, the basic idea of anti-Semitism or racism. So that makes him another thing completely different from the Nazis. He he entertained the idea of allying with with the Third Reich and and uh, and, and Rome and Tokyo, but he didn't uh, um, get there quite. Um, the the thing is that uh, when Hochschild proposed the idea of bringing Jewish immigrants, he said, "Okay, let's bring immigrants, but not only Jewish. I will open the the, the doors of Bolivia for any person of goodwill willing to work." And he did so. So he didn't have this idea. For, for him, Jews were gringos like any other gringo, like any other foreigner. He, he had no ideas of, of, of a superiority of racism or so on. Moreover, there was a political party that his peers of his region had founded. It was, uh, it was called the, the Partido Orientalista, which would only accept white people. And Bush said, you will dissolve this party immediately or I will make you shot. So that was Bush. Okay, another complicated person. Um, speaking <laughs> of speaking of complicated, um, there are a couple of questions, I, and I'll give you the two parts to this. Um, how do you reconcile Hochschild as uh, the Tin Baron with his role as a, a savior, and what what challenges have you faced in reconciling that? And at the same time, similarly connected is how is he viewed today by, by Bolivians? Um, as both of those or as one or the other? 
Let me start. Robert, I know that you, you want to say something also about this, but Hoshil had a complex personality, very complex. First of all, this thing of a, a tin baron, uh, an important businessman, uh, a shark almost, right? And he wanted to be known as a businessman. He wanted to be known as a magnet. He wanted to be known as a tin baron. He didn't want to be known as a, as a person that saved lives. This is very interesting. This, is, this explains also why this story was, wasn't told earlier, right? Because he didn't want to make a big fuss about this. Even the, the refu refugees, the exiles that came here, many of them didn't know about Hoshil. They heard the name, of course, he was a, 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 big, a, a, a big businessman, whatever, but, and some knew, uh, but many didn't. When they then when they uh, get uh, when they got the checks that the company uh, entity that that was created uh, they didn't know that Hoshil was providing the, the, the funds uh, so a big magnet a, a, a big boss that probably was abusive uh, or abusive for the for the terms of of those years. But but also a, a person that was saving lives, but didn't want the people to know. And finally, the other aspect, the uh, it was he wasn't able to 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 connect with his son, and he he uh, had this strange from his, from his son for most of his life. So everything is kind of. Uh, makes a contradiction, but at the end is explaining a, a, a complex uh, personality. Um, I, I will only contribute with one thing. When we asked Leo Spitzer, the, the, the author of Hotel Bolivia, if refugees knew about, about Hoshil, they, he said, well, his name hovered in conversations, but we never saw him. He never showed himself. Except the one that, that the, the, the one time that when he inaugurated this uh, agricultural facility once, and then never again. He he didn't want the publicity of uh, being a a, a a good of a, a man of goodwill. He he rather be known as a, as a businessman. Interesting. Um, we have time for one more question, um, and I'm going to. I'm going to make an executive decision. Um, do you have testimonies from individuals that he rescued? Are there are those available in any way? Did you how many um, speak, people did you speak to? We had the chance to speak with a with a with a few of them that they got to Bolivia when they were uh, children, uh, and they had memories, of course. But also they had the memories of their parents. Um, we had the chance to interview them. They they were healthy, so they remembered a lot. Uh, so so that was good. Uh, but it, it is sad to say that some of them, most of them, they were not much anyway. They were not many. Uh, they died before the book was was uh, uh, presented, so that was sad for us. And of course, we, we put that in, in the book that uh, we thanked them, and it was sad not to see them in the, in the presentation. Right. All right. Um, I'll just reiterate that there are many questions asking for the book to be available in English, so hopefully we'll be able to see that soon and you'll let us know. Um, and I'd like to thank you both. Uh, that was really, really wonderful uh, and very, very interesting. I hope everyone here has found our program today interesting. Uh, our next webinar will take place on January 23rd. Dr. Anna Carolyn Augustin, who is the recipient of the Ruth and David Musher JDC Archives Fellowship, will give a lecture on JDC's involvement in Jewish cultural reconstruction in the aftermath of the Holocaust. Invitations will be sent out during the first week of January, and you will be able to register for it on our Facebook, the JDC Archives Facebook page as well. We hope that many of you will be able to join us. 
please sign up for our e-newsletter if you would like to be added to our mailing list for public programs. And last but not least, please remember us in your end of year giving. And thank you for joining us. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Raul. Much appreciated. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, thank much. You very much. And we, we really hope that you will have the book in English really soon during the, nine, the year of uh, 2024. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Thanks. Take Thank care. you very much. Thanks.